If you've been following my channel for the last five to six years, you would know that I'm an avid Blackmagic Cinema Camera user, as well as a DaVinci Resolve user. So you can only imagine that every time Blackmagic says they're gonna be announcing something, that I get super excited, especially when it comes to camera bodies, because we were all waiting for that one camera, the box camera, and we finally got it. But do we really need it? Is it what we really wanted? Today, I'm gonna be going over some of the updates that Blackmagic announced during their NAV announcement update in regards to DaVinci Resolve, and the new Blackmagic Pixis 6K. But I'm only gonna be telling you about the things that interest me. I'm not gonna be telling you all the in-depth specs. If you guys wanna watch it, go watch the, the 2024 NAV updates on the Blackmagic uh, YouTube channel. They'll get all into the nitty gritty things that they have to offer. Now, DaVinci Resolve 19 is a whole new animal. There's a, a lot of exciting things that I'm looking forward to. One of the biggest things that video editing software has implemented in their programs is AI. And this term, DaVinci Resolve, has a lot to offer in regards to AI. Some of these new tools include Fairlight AI tracking, new audio transcription tools where they can differentiate different speakers, a new six vector palette plugin where you can alternate different colors and isolate them more easily, new text-based timeline editing, as well as a new film like tones plugin that they offer in the new film look creator, which is my most exciting thing that they've done with DaVinci Resolve. One of the existing capabilities that we do have is to transcribe audio. Based on, um, so you just pretty much select and you right click everything. Now with DaVinci Resolve 19, you're able to literally edit your timeline based off what audio you want to include. So if you transcribe everything in your timeline, you're able to select the text that you want and that you don't want. And if you delete that text, it actually removes that video from the timeline. So you don't have to physically go into the timeline and, and trim and edit it out. And you're able to differentiate different speakers. So say you're hosting a podcast, the new software is able to identify who's speaking and edit your video based off of what audio you delete. If you have multiple camera views, for instance, if you have a podcast with two cameras, uh, each camera's on a different speaker, it'll be able to differentiate who's speaking. So it, it can actually speed up your workflow quite a bit. That's the main functionality of AI is to sort of speed up things, save us time, and to cut down on the amount of work. I feel like that's gonna be a great capability that we're gonna be able to have on DaVinci Resolve 19. And I'm actually looking forward to using it because I'm gonna be trying to start a podcast on my own. Eventually I got everything set up, so that's really exciting. The new six vector palette capabilities or color slice is pretty cool too. It isolates different colors for you. So you got uh, red, a skin, uh, skin meaning skin tones, and then you got a yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magneta. You can actually adjust the density, saturation, and hue of each single color, which is pretty cool. So instead of going in and using the waveform way of luma versus hue or luma versus saturation, you can physically go into the colors and there's different sliders on it. And there's different sliders that make it quicker and easier to visualize that. The dedicated skin one's gonna be a huge one because I, everyone can probably agree that editing skin is probably one of the most difficult when it comes to color grading because skin tones aren't always perfect. And I think DaVinci Resolve as a, as a whole in the past has made skin tone coloring a little bit easier compared to other softwares with the different types of vector scopes that's included in the software. Another great thing that's in included in DaVinci Resolve 19 is the new IntelliTrack AI capabilities. So I haven't dove deep dive into how it, exactly how it works yet, but pretty much all you have to do is select a point. So at the bottom of the tracking uh, tab, there's, um, where's, there's the point tracker. You can now choose IntelliTracker and just select a point and be able to track it. it. Seems a little bit easier to use, but I don't know what the difference is in regards to the old tracking, like what is better. I know before you had to sort of select an area and it tracked points within it, in that area, but now you can add multiple points or a single point on a video clip and be able to track it that way. We'll see where the AI component comes in. Seems like it's just gonna make life easier in regards to tracking and not necessarily get any better, but make it a little bit easier of an interface to use and calculate a little bit better due to the AI capabilities. Another life-saving option that's included in DaVinci Resolve is the new ultra noise reduction uh, AI capabilities. I've only seen the, the demo of it. It's hard to tell on screen if it's actually really that good, but um, in the past, we've got Lightroom and Photoshop that have included uh, noise reduction capabilities with AI and the results are a lot better, sometimes too good, a little bit too sharp, a little bit too fake, um, but I can only imagine that this is gonna make life easier when you're confronted with the situation as a video creator, when you're there's a lot of grain because of low light situations or um, just your camera due to high megapixel count has, a, has grain in your footage. I'm assuming that it's gonna be blowing out of the water compared to the, the other noise reduction that's in there. And hopefully, hopefully it doesn't include a lot of data where your machine's gonna slow down. Uh, that's one of the things that's worrying me a little bit because I have an older machine that I work on. I'm working on a 2019 MacBook Pro, uh, an Intel laptop. So 
I'm just worried that that capability won't, a lot of, even a lot of these AI capabilities won't be able to work on here, but uh, we'll see how it is in real time use once we get our hands on it. Okay, so the most exciting thing that I think DaVinci Resolve 19 has to offer is the new film look creator. So I don't know about, I can't speak for everyone, but I can tell you that a lot of creators are probably using some sort of film emulation. I found it hard to invest in that because I'm not a full-time creator, I'm a part-time creator. So purchasing an external third-party film emulation for me wasn't in the books yet. I was seeing if I could just get by with what was included in uh, DaVinci Resolve. Um, they, they did have some components of, uh, I guess, a, film, a filmic look, but it wasn't all bundled together. So now you're gonna be getting a film look creator, which enables you to add film like features. So more grain and halation and highlight capabilities. Pretty much in the film look creator, you're given different styles that you can pick from. You can choose stuff like a bleach bypass, nostalgic vintage, different modes. You're able to control white points, black points, add a little fade. You can do some in-depth split toning on certain clips. Uh, they have a little bit of, a little bit of capabilities to switch the tone of the, the skin with the skin bias. I think this is the most exciting because for me, for me not having a film emulator and not working with one, I think having this free one is gonna be a game changer. Um, and it's amazing because it's included in the software already. So really looking forward to using that. I think it's gonna push a lot of people away from using LUTs, um, unfortunately. So anybody who's looking at creating LUTs might see a little bit of a reduction in their LUT sales just because, every, like I said, everyone's trying to go for that film look and uh, everyone's got their own different style and there's a lot of great creators that I can probably give you 10 names right now of who creates a good film look, but being, having the capability to make that easier uh, just in a free software is is crazy because I don't know like I just feel I feel like DaVinci Resolve as a program is stepping the game up making things more accessible it does make the market a little saturated and and stuff but it also it speeds things up it makes things easier it makes being a filmmaker to create cinematic movie like type of videos easier and that's what we all want we want everything to look like a movie, we want, we want, we want dramatic looking videos, if that makes sense. Another new uh, DaVinci Resolve feature that I wanted to include, which I thought was cool, is uh, the blurring of the background. So you can create a mask of your background and then blur it uh, out, making it look like you have a higher aperture. Or is it lower? I always get mixed if it's higher or lower, but if you're restricted to like a 2.8 uh, aperture on a lens, you can push that blurriness in the background a little bit more to get that nice, smooth, creamy bokeh. Being able to do that in post is nuts. You can have a cheap lens that doesn't have a high aperture range and create that nice creamy bokeh in the background, which is awesome. Aside from that, we do have some motion graphic effects capabilities. We also have some new facial feature AI tracking capabilities. Stuff that didn't really interest me, I don't use too much, but maybe I'll look into it in the future, knowing that everything's easier to do now with this DaVinci Resolve. So yeah, can't wait to that, the release of that. Right now they do have the public beta out, so if you're interested, go get the public beta. I, I'm not gonna be holding off on the public beta because I only have one current workstation that I'm working from, which restricts me from trying another, trying the beta out because I don't wanna screw up my computer. Never even done the beta, so if, if anybody knows, if you can ever, if you guys can tell me if the beta is a separate program or it replaces the currently installed program, that would be great. Maybe I'll try it out. Okay, so next is cameras. I did know the day before that they were gonna be announcing the Ursa 12, uh, 12K Cine Edition camera, and that camera is obviously way out of my budget, so I won't be talking about it too much, uh, but it pretty much has larger sensors, more capabilities. It's essentially the camera that Blackmagic wanted to create without any budget. They just wanted to create something that had the best capabilities in a camera, and for its price point compared to other large cameras like a Red or a Alexa, I think it's, it's, fairly, it's a fairly good camera if you're in the field for creating larger, uh, motion pictures or larger projects. But today I'm gonna to be talking about the Blackmagic Pixis 6K, the box camera that everyone thought they wanted. Now, uh, when I seen the announcement for this camera, I was shocked that they finally released it. I got so excited, super excited when they released it. It's pretty much the Blackmagic Cinema camera, not the six, not, not, not the Pocket Cinema camera 6K, but the Blackmagic Cinema camera 6K, which is the newest um, old, the newest Blackmagic, I guess, pocket looking camera that they released uh, back in December, I believe, in a box camera. So most of the specs are the same. You have uh, SDI inputs on this one. Uh, there's a back battery, 
capability. They come in three mounts. There's the, uh, the L mount, the PL mount, and the EF mount. In regards to storage capabilities, you can only use CF Express cards or you can either use, or, or you can use an SSD. Uh, no SD cards, obviously. You're gonna be shooting high file videos, so you're gonna you don't want to be using SD cards on that. Just based on the body design, yeah, it's a dream that you, if we finally get a camera comparable to the uh, Red Komodo, where we can. I feel and I want I don't want to say ergonomically, but it's more structured to be able to be held and tucked in, and it, the balance is weird. Everyone knows that the old. Um, Blackmagic camera. Everyone knows that the old Blackmagic camera was a little bit awkward in regards to putting on gimbals and holding a little bit. It's like a traditional camera, but like a larger one. And it just, it, I hate to say it, but it doesn't look the best. The, the picture, obviously the picture in the Blackmagic cameras, I think it's the closest you can get to Hollywood grade at a fraction of the price. And I even see even more than a fraction of the price. So uh, you can only imagine when I seen the Pixis come out that it was a box camera. It was something that, I wanted, it was sort of seated in my head that I wanted this box camera. You do get a full frame 36 by 24 6K sensor, same as the Blackmagic cinema camera. And it records in 12-bit Blackmagic RAW. And it records extremely small H.264 proxy files in it. So it'll make the editing process easier and uh, lag a little less for you. Now the camera enables you to go open gate three to uh, crop ratio. So you get, you get to maximize that sensor. And you can go all the way down to 1080 HD, but keep in mind that the lower resolution that you do, the more cropped in the picture is gonna be. So you're gonna be restricted to that. There is a large monitor built in right to the camera. The only problem is it's on the side. It's your traditional four inch LCD monitor screen. The side screen, I wasn't really thinking about it when I first seen the announcement. I was just thinking I could just mount a monitor on the top, but a lot of people have, a lot of people have brought up good points that if you're starting off, this, this camera really isn't the right camera for you, only because you're gonna have to be rigging it up quite a bit. I would say to start smaller, unless you have the money, you wanna spend the money, that's fine, go ahead and do it. The monitor's on the side, so if you wanna just take it out of box, and if your monitor, if you run out of monitor batteries for whatever reason, you're restricted to the side, you're not gonna be able to perform any handheld stuff if your monitor dies. So keep that in mind with this camera. You're gonna definitely need a monitor for it. With the announcement of the new Blackmagic Assists going down in price, I think that it's worth it to get maybe a Blackmagic Assist, only because the color signs would match on the monitor compared to what the camera is actually shooting. Um, a lot of the struggle that I see with monitors versus cameras is the color science and the exposure. It's not identically the same on the screen as it is in the camera. I do have a Ninja V and uh, I do notice that there's a little bit more greens in that screen compared to what's on my Blackmagic Cinema camera. So if I, were, if I were to upgrade to this camera, I would probably get a Blackmagic Assist and use that as uh, my main monitor. Another thing about this low budget camera is it does include uh, XLR inputs. Now I know the traditional Blackmagic included that, but just having that capability in the camera is pretty great that you can hook up an XLR audio mic. One of the cool things about this camera is the uh, customizable side mounting plate. Now we did see uh, essentially that you can hook up different types of plates on the side and which will allow you to hook up different accessories and different gear, whether it's a handle or or maybe adding your SSD mounted to the side. I think that's pretty cool. The only thing is it's on the right side. I wish they would have something on the left, but we might see a cage coming from uh, external third party companies like Small Rig or Condor Blue that might create something that allows us to mount to the, the left. The only, the only thing is the screens there and the buttons there. So currently I have my, my handle mounted to the left of my camera and uh, nothing on the right, I just hold it on the right. So ha having to switch that might be a little difficult, but we'll see what comes out of that and what they create. I'm sure everyone's gonna be really innovative and in trying to come up with the best solution to accommodate different types of creators and their style of holding the cameras and everything like that. There's an ethernet port right in the camera making it super easy to transfer different files onto the cloud. That's gonna be making that process going from the camera to the cloud way easier. You'll also be able to use the Ursa Cine uh, EF viewfinder in there to um, add to the top of the camera. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. I don't really use viewfinders too much, but I am noticing that I am starting to use them a little bit more, uh, especially in scenarios where it's hard with the lighting conditions outside and, and sunny and stuff. But it is something that you're gonna have to pay extra for. You're not, it's not gonna be included with the camera. It's, uh, it's an addition to uh, what you currently get with the camera. Now, to be honest, I don't know if this was a capability before, but it does promote live streaming with this camera. I think now with the implementation of like a lot of being creators being on live streaming like on like kick and stuff like that and twitch uh having that capability to do live stream built into the camera i think is great i don't know if my black magic pocket cinema camera 4k includes that capability and the rest of the specs on the camera are like the black magic cinema camera 6k so if you want to check out samples of what it's going to look like obviously you can look at the black magic cinema camera quality Keep in mind if you're upgrading from a 4K 
Uh, there's gonna be a lot of storage. Uh, there's gonna be quite a bit of storage increase, so that, that involves more hard, hard drives. That's my thoughts on the camera. Some of the cons I see with this camera are the side-mounted screen being limited to that. Uh, we still don't have a proper continuous autofocus on any of the Blackmagic cameras, so you do need an external focus. One of the things that I've seen creators point out, and I didn't really notice off the bat, is that the top handle doesn't have anywhere to mount a monitor. I'm going based off pictures, so uh, you might have to rig something up in order to put your monitor on, which is a little bit silly since we have to put a top monitor on in order to properly be able to see what we're shooting from a, a lower angle and, and uh, not using the side monitor. So that's a little bit frustrating. I think it's a good start though that we have this first generation of a box camera. I think it's only gonna get grow and get better from here and we'll work out all the kinks. Me personally, I thought I was gonna be purchasing this camera at least within the next year or so, but I think I, I may hold off just to see what problems, more pros and cons that people have in the real life world of using this camera. I feel like we're gonna find out a little bit more about uh, the downfalls of it. And I'm not saying it's a bad camera, it, it is a great camera, it shoots great, it's what we wanted, we asked for it, we got it. Do I need it? No, I can make do with my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. I'm not shooting super, super high-end budget stuff. Something that I don't need and I can get by without, but it's definitely on my radar, so I'll be keeping an eye out for that. Really excited to see that we finally made the jump to a box body though. Maybe I'll even rent it for a weekend or something uh, once it's available, just to see how it is ergonomically and how I like holding it and everything. Really looking forward to what the future has in store in regards to Blackmagic. I think this round they really stepped up the game. They really gave us a lot of the tools that we asked for for DaVinci Resolve as well as uh, we got our box camera. So guys, you can't complain. Another thing, I didn't even say this yet, but the price of the box camera Canadian at least, just over, around $4,300. So for that, having that camera and like, those capabilities at such a price point is out of this world. Is it worth selling your Red Komodo if you have one or your Red Komodo X if you have one? I can't, I can't really say, but I think if you wanna cut down and be minimalistic and have something that's a little bit cheaper, a little bit more affordable, pocket some money, I think it's gonna be one of the best bets. Um, just know you gotta rig it, rig it up, you're gonna have to include more batteries and stuff like that, so. Let me know what you guys think down below. Super excited for these new updates and I can't wait to use them. I told you guys I wanted to bring some more health into uh, this channel, so I'm gonna have some more health videos coming out. And yeah, super excited. Um, we'll see you guys in the next video. Ciao.